Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Prada Museum for more of our weekly conversations in English, this project that is made possible with the generosity of the supporters of the American Friends of the Prada Museum. The American Friends is a nonprofit organization, and everything we do is to help the Prada Museum to help study and share and grow the collection in as many ways as we can. And if you'd like to know more about the things that we do and how you can get involved, you can find out more on our website and also find out more about our sister organization, the Amigos de Museo del Prado. Today we're going to be looking at a beautiful portrait, a self-portrait, that is so special not just because of its amazing technical quality, but also because of the ideas that went into its creation, the ideas behind it. And with these ideas, we're going to learn a little bit more about Durr, about Albrecht Durr, about his idea of what an artist is and what it could aspire to be in society at the end of the 15th century. Durer was born and raised in, in Nuremberg, although his father was originally from Hungary and he was a goldsmith, so he grew up in uh, in the goldsmith's workshop, although from early on it was clear that Albrecht's talent in painting and in drawing would really put him on a path outside of that workshop. He traveled twice to Italy, and this is where he was able to pick up on the artistic advances that were being made in the Italian Renaissance. He was very famous already in his lifetime, both as a painter and as a printmaker, and he would end up working both for Maximilian I and for Charles V. This painting was actually given by the Nuremberg City Council to Charles I of England in 1636. After Charles I's execution, there was an enormous sale of his art collection. This was called the, the auction of the, of the century, the sale of the century. And so many different important paintings and sculptures all throughout Europe, really, and different museums and all throughout the world came from this sale of Charles I's collection. And this self-portrait was one, and it was bought in 1654, and since then it has been in the Royal Collections and the Prado Museum. So this is a self-portrait of the artist from 1498. Here we can see a little bit more information. If you want to find out more about the painting later, you can look it up on the Prado's website. And in this image, Durer has placed himself in an interior space. He's looking right at the viewer. And in the back, we can see that he's included this window and we can see a landscape through the window. And this is a device, a way that artists can add depth to a scene. If we come a little farther down, we can see the date. We can see how we know the date this was painted. And also um, the very special way, the unique way that Durer signed his paintings. And the inscription, which says, I painted this according to my image. So in 1498, this would place the painting after Durer's first trip to Italy. And we can tell here that the artist is showing us that he has been to Italy and that he knows what's going on there and he understands the advances that are being made. And really because he's taken what was originally a Flemish model for portraiture in this half-length uh, view with the sitter slightly turned, looking towards the viewer, um, and he's made it slightly more Italian. And how has he made it more Italian? Because this has much more monumentality, much more structure than a Flemish portrait would. And we can see that really in the repetition of horizontal and vertical lines. Starting here with the window, and again with the window. Even with this element of his clothes here, and this piece of architecture here, and also in, in his arm and the way that he's posing. It looks like we have this, this L shape over and over again. When we get close, we can really appreciate all of the quality, all of the small details that we're able to get because of his use of oil painting. He looks calm and collected and confident and looks at us boldly. And he's painted himself in really stylish, really elegant clothes for the time. He has on a black and white jacket. It's kind of loosely open and a matching cap that goes with it. Here when we get close, we can appreciate all of those details from the oil painting and all of the, each strand of his hair. It's great. And, uh, then we have this silk cord that's 
holding on a, a cloak that's just kind of draped over his shoulder, a gold-trimmed undershirt. And as we go all the way down, we'll see that something is just really drawing us, drawing our attention to his hands, that we really want to look at his hands in his painting. And we see that he's wearing gloves, and, and not just any gloves, but these are expensive doe skin gloves. So what has he done here? Well, Durer has painted himself as a gentleman. Now, the invention of self-portraiture in the West is always really interconnected with ideas of class and social rank. And social rank really is determined by one's birth and one's occupation. And the value of one's occupation really depends on its proximity to physical labor. The closer you were to doing a job that was, that was done with your hands, the lower respected it was. The more that you worked with ideas and something that was abstract, the more respected it was. And this division also applied to arts. And art was divided into what seemed liberal and intellectual, which would be things like rhetoric and poetry, and then things like uh, painting and sculpture, which were mechanical and manual, things that had to be done with your hands. So then again, we think of his, his gloved hands wearing these expensive clothes. Durer has really presented himself here without any, uh, without any materials that would identify him as someone who works with his hands. The only attributes that he presents to us are wealth and status and his name. Already by 1400, there's already this predominant idea that a painting or a sculpture was a combination both of handiwork, but also of intellect. It wasn't enough to reproduce a reality, just the likeness of an image. Art had to have both of these qualities, handiwork and intellect. Michelangelo would actually say that we paint with our brain, not with our hands. And this poses a challenge to portraits, really, which inherently are trying to reproduce the likeness of someone. But it also explains why some portraits, like this one, are so captivating. Because it's not just the likeness of someone, but it's the psychology, the ethos of that person. And Durer here is showing us his psychology, showing that he works not just with his hands, but with his mind, with his intellect. And he shows us that with how much we can see the psychological depth of his gaze. And then it really drives the idea home with the fact that he's captured this in painting, which makes him um, an artist in the liberal humanist sense. And his self-awareness in this category as a liberal artist at the end of the 15th century is really, really amazing. And it tells us not just about his social status, not just about him, but about the status of art and of the artist in society. And we'll leave it here for today. I hope that you've had uh, a good time learning a little bit more about Durer and about the role of artists in society in the 15th century. And uh, we'll see you again next Wednesday for more videos in English. Thanks for joining.